You're listening to Coding Blocks, episode 21. Subscribe to us and leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, and more using your favorite podcast app. And visit us at codingblocks.net where you can find show notes, examples, discussion, and more. And send your feedback, questions, and rants to comments at codingblocks.net via email. And follow us on Twitter <laughs> at codingblocks or head to www.codingblocks.net and find our other using social Using a links web browser. At the top of the page. You know, we never get any comments to comments at Coding Blocks. Everybody goes to our Contact Us page, so... No, we get comments. What are you talking about? We've got usually, comments. yeah, through our contact page. Usually. All right, whatever. Comments at codingblocks.net. All right, and with that, welcome to Coding Blocks. I'm Alan Underwood. I'm Joe Zach. And I'm Michael Outlaw. And All right, that's it for today's show. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a short one. We do this every time. We need to put in initials by the first statement. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, I vote uh, Alan. All right. So um, first we want to send out a thank you to some new reviews that came in. We got a couple on Stitcher from uh, John Chu and Adam the Hun. That's fantastic. And we also got a couple over on iTunes from Spitz Gobi and Jay Demius. Dem- I have no idea. Easy for you to say. Yeah, fair enough. So um, thank you very much. We do appreciate those. Always brings a smile, makes us happy. So thank you. Yep, and we also got some really neat, nice feedback on the last episode, which was on uh, testing, unit testing, different kinds of testing. And dodgy underscore coder mentions that uh, mentioned random testing, which is something we didn't mention. So that includes like fuzz testing and, and different sorts of other things. And uh, he actually recommended a course on a free course on Udacity. So we'll have a link to that. Uh, also, Russell Hammett mentions a .NET Rocks episode, um, which referred to testing in the zone and how testing kind of um, help you kind of get into flow when you're writing application. How uh, also coming back to your test after a break and help you kind of pick back up where you were. And uh, we'll have a link to that in the show notes. That was episode 1001. That's a lot of episodes. We're getting close. <laughs> <laughs> Nine hundred eight. Well, I was going to say eighty, 80 but yeah. Well, yeah, but this would be 21, so this would be 979. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Long work day, brain no worky. We're, yeah. We're catching up. Yeah, so uh, let's get into that. Uh, t- tonight's topic is going to be tools. Yep, and we actually had someone write in. Uh, Lewis wrote in, asked us about what kind of tools we, we like to use. And if we oh, gather them I up thought we were spot. calling out the people we thought were tools. <laughs> oh. oh, God, I had to change my show notes. Oh, yeah, this is, things are very different. We'll be right back. TikTok, TikTok, TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah, I mean, so we're just, we had to narrow it down because we had a bunch, right? And Outlaw made us adhere to some rules, which was basically we each had to pick five. Well, yeah, okay. Hold on. Well, since I so rudely interrupted Joe, he, he can explain, uh, you know, what Lewis's original statement oh, was. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah, he's just uh, asking for, you know, we, we do tips of the week or tips of the month uh, every episode, but we don't have anything kind of gathered up. So we wanted to come up with a nice page that you can go to and kind of see a list of tools that we like and, and uh, pitch. So uh, this edit, the episode is basically dedicated to that, and uh, we've got a little fun maybe uh, with some resolutions, which might be another episode. So here, here's the rules that Alan was uh, hinting at. <clears throat> Number one. You only get to pick five favorites. So you're going to hear, we each picked five favorites, and then there's going to be five that the three of us agreed on that was, you know, uh, one that was mutual between us. Um, but you only get, we only got to each pick five, right? Yep. So you don't hear resharper three times. <sighs> right. Number two, a favorite can be anything. It could be a website. It could be a browser add-in. It could be an IDE add-in. It could be an application. It could be a mobile app. It could be a piece of hardware. Whatever. It, if it helps you do your job, it counts as a favorite. All right? Number three. I don't know if you understood number one, Alan. But <laughs> you only get to pick five, okay? Man who comes in with 11. Can we seriously make some more? That, that, that was after I shortened the list. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Number four was we had to order them. So we're going to call them out from uh, five to one. So one is going to be the most favorite. Five is a normal favorite. And the last rule was that you can't repeat something from someone else's list. So anything on my list has to be unique to me, and Joe's is unique to him, and Alan's is unique to him. All right, And that's why we have the final category with the ones that we all like. So let's, let's start into that with the fives. All right. So the Jackson fives. Here it is. 
<laughs> so my number five that I picked was ScreenFlow for Mac. So I've done a couple videos on YouTube, and I plan on doing more in the new year, and maybe even before, don't know. But I use ScreenFlow to record my screen session so that when I'm doing SQL Server or any of that kind of stuff, I am... You know, as I type, I sit there and talk into the microphone and do all that. And that is made possible by ScreenFlow. And I choose that because it's a Mac application, but it's a hundred bucks as opposed to um, Ooh, some I of those. Well, Camtasia on the PC is 300 from Adobe. And there's really not too many competing products out there that are, are of quality. And ScreenFlow is excellent. And I use it to record both my Windows, which I do in VM, and and my Mac stuff. So... Uh, I find that thing extremely useful. So that's one of the things I do for being able to help and share and teach and do all that. So that's that's my number five. All right. All right. And mine, I keep changing mine <laughs> as we're uh, sitting here talking. But uh, as Al mentioned, he had some kind of strict rules around this uh, little game we're playing here. But I've somewhat circumvented them by putting multiple items in each of mine. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> We're programmers. We find holes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, first off, I want to mention, if you guys remember Vlad, uh, we had him on in episode nine. He sold me on solid state drives. It's huge, like five times performance boost. It's amazing. I love solid state drives. However... Uh, if you don't want to drop the money on solid state drives, then I recommend uh, slash r slash programming on Reddit and Hacker News. For, Wait a minute. Well, this is for while you're waiting on those stupid compile times because you don't have SSD. Yeah, that's a cheater. <laughs> yeah, you cheated, dude. That's like a 5A and a 5B. <laughs> that's right. I snuck it in there. <laughs> like, my fifth one is 5A, but if you can't have an SSD, <laughs> then while you're waiting on your compile times. <laughs> hey, well, uh, that's what you get for taking the one you're about to say. Okay, so so my number five is Chocolatey. So if you're not already using this, okay, for let's say if you're a Unix user, this would be to Windows what AppGit would be to uh, Ubuntu, right? This is this is a way to just from a command line find apps and install them, and it's awesome. Yeah, so like right now, if I get a new computer, I'm gonna go install Pigeon. I'm gonna install Git. I'm gonna install Sublime Editor. Whatever. These are all things that I would have to go to a website. I have to download. I have to install. Next, next, next. Uh, so on. It's a real big pain in the butt. Chocolatey allows you to do that all via command line. You can save off scripts and all sorts of cool, cool stuff. You don't even have to know if it's already there yet. You can just do like a, a Choco it. search notepad and find out all the different notepad type applications that are going to be out there. You know, and, and then if you say, oh, that's the one I want, Choco install. Oh, you know what, though? What you just said is beautiful. If you actually saved off your own script that had a list uh -huh. of 10 utilities that right. you want installed, bam. Here's, right. Here's my script. Yep. Reinstall your, your Windows environment every month. I'm down with that. Yeah. <laughs> we know some people who do. All right. The Fantastic Fours. All right. Uh, first off, I wanted to start with Markdown, which uh, if you're not familiar with that, it's basically uh, just kind of some conventions around plain text typing that you can then take and transform into uh, formatting. So you can get rich text formatting like bold, bullets, uh, hyperlinks, stuff like that. But what I really like about Markdown is it lets me just type and focus on my sentences. And I'm not getting hung up trying to make sure that you know everything's on one page or two page or the page breaks are right or the indentations are lined up. And I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. I just focus on the content. And then when I'm ready to drop in an email or a document, then I take it and I transform it. And padow, done. It looks pretty nice. I do a little bit of tweaking at the end. And I haven't spun my wheels for hours trying to make you know this crap look nice as I was writing it. Now, well, you say all this stuff about not making it look nice, but when when you said Markdown originally, I was thinking about like Markdown for like readmes and oh yeah, and it's nice because it looks nice if you're reading text. So like you, you are know. making it look nice in that. That's yeah. the point. But you don't have to get hung up in like oh should this H uh, two be blue or should it be black? Uh, then you know, oh god, do who that. does that? Oh man, a lot of people. <laughs> Those people are called designers. <laughs> but then, but here's oh, my no. question though. Oh no, there's so many different markdown specifications. Okay, so ooh, oh. so yeah. which here, one are you using? Comes. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let, 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 let me ask Joe though. Which one are you using? Like specifically, what type of markdown? So I feel a little bit bad. You know, uh, this guy was at um, Gruber. John Gruber wrote markdown and came up with some rules and. Uh, there are some ambiguities, ambiguities, but for the most part, I think it works well. However, I do know about the whole standard markdown kind of argument, and there's a lot of people that I admire behind it, so um, I'm probably going to end up going the standard markdown route, even though the name is somewhat of a diss. 
Okay, so this is actually a utility you're talking about, not just using. Oh, I'm talking about a convention. Well, he's okay. talking about just uh, the standard. The convention, okay. But, yeah. but here, now, if you haven't already used this, here's an awesome little utility for you. Markdown pad. Ooh. <laughs> My bone. <laughs> well, I just cheated the system and added in a second one into yours. Like well, how I did that? <laughs> but I, I want to say the way I do it, but we're going to mention it in a little bit here. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Okay. Well, I'm just saying, like, if you haven't already uh, seen Markdown Pad, you can go check it out, markdownpad.com. Uh, it's an interesting little utility that as you're, it's, it's WYSIWYGs it. So as you're typing it, you can see what it's going to look oh, like. Nice. Um, so if you want to have a nice looking readme in your, uh, your GitHub repository, then you can see it. Very nice. All right. So my number four, Fiddler. Because sometimes you just need to see the details. I mean, you need to see what's going on. Well, I thought you were in a bluegrass band. Hmm. No, that'd be the fiddle. Oh, yeah. So yeah, okay. no, this is fiddler. You're not a fiddler? No. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's well, like in the sense fiddler, that I use right? the app, though. Right, it's a Telerik app. It is awesome. You can actually save and replay the sessions. Uh, so that makes it nice if you're working with a team and you need to be able to send some other developer, like, hey, this is what happened. You can send it to them and let them replay it. Or executing replay attacks. You know, whatever you might be working on. Yeah, you know, if you're from North Korea. and You can modify the uh, the packets that are sent. You can do all kinds of stuff. It, it's actually a pretty excellent tool. Yeah, it is really fantastic. If you're doing any kind of web development and you don't already know about it, then you should. So then why would you use this over, say, the built-in Chrome tools or the, um, you know, any of those? Um, because this, you can have act uh, as the proxy for all the traffic on your on your machine not just that one specific browser so if you want to see um you know that might be great to just see the interaction on your one machine but it, you know what if your local host web server was making another call out for some reason you know to a third party something like that and you need to see what was happening as part of the overall transaction you know chrome's tool built-in dev tools are fantastic but they're not necessarily going to paint the complete picture. Plus, the ability to share and replay these results is huge. And you can also put add-ins, JSON formatters, <laughs> JavaScript, syntax viewers. Yeah. Well, I think it, the JSON's already in there. Uh, they you added it add recently. Add anything for that. Used to, you had to. But they have plugins that you can add in. So yeah. there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do with it. Yeah. Um, uh, so with that, my number four choice is Evernote and Sketch. Wait, now you're doing two as well? Well, they're you they're kind of they're the same they're the same company, right? So it's all kind of part of the same bundle. So here's the thing, like as developers, there are a lot of times that you're working with business users uh, or maybe even other developers and you need to point something out on a screen that you're working on or in some code that you've got. And a fantastic way to be able to do it is to make some notes with with Evernote, we'll say, take a screenshot and then use Sketch to mark it up with you know, arrows, circling things, highlighting text, whatever. And it just makes it incredibly easy to do that kind of stuff. So, and the fact that it's portable between your phone, your PC, your Mac, whatever, like they've got applications on every platform. It's probably one of the most useful tools for doing that kind of thing. So Evernote and Sketch. All right, let's get into the terrible threes. Here we go. My, my number three. Post Sharp, because I like AOP. <laughs> yeah, you're down with AOP? I'm down with AOP. Right. Very nice. Uh, it's not free, unfortunately. I mean, it has a free version, but I wish that the other version... I wish that the free version was able to do more, but, yeah, they got to make a buck. So so what's, like, the number one thing you do with Post Sharp? The number one thing that I would do with it? Yeah. Uh... I mean, I've got like simple little aspects that I'll use for like uh, debugging purposes or or tracing purposes, things like that, uh, okay. that I just reuse over and over. So, like as a debugging utility, that's kind of your your first. Like, if you're in a um, new project, like what's the thing that you're like, all right, time to yeah, go get Yeah, I mean, sharp. yeah, I, I would say that it, it probably. I don't know that it should be my first, but it, I would probably say that it is my first that I have used where I've like added trace capabilities into it. If I want to be able to see like, well, how long was that really running for, or you know what was the actual execution path that was happening here? You know, things like that just to help like understand what was happening at a time. Cool. And so. why that over Vlad's AOP framework or, or along <laughs> with, I was afraid this was going to come up. 
I mean, <laughs> so so, um, yeah. They're they're you know as long as you're doing aspect oriented programming, it you know whichever one suits your your fancy. They solve the they saw the same problem, but they come at it from different angles, right? So um, Post Sharp is doing it at the um, uh, compilation. Well, well, there's not that just that, but I was just speaking of it from the point of view of like in the post sharp world, you're declaring what aspects you want to run on the methods, so you don't care who the caller is. Whereas in an aspect or uh, um, aspectacular, you're actually doing it as the caller. You're saying, "Hey, I don't care what that method is already supposed to do. These are the aspects that I want it to run." Right. So you're solving the same type of problem, which is I want to apply aspects, but you're doing it from different ways. So right? is it safe to say that like a consideration where you would use Post Sharp would be you have this existing app and you don't want to go touch all the method signatures. You just want to be able to decorate some stuff and have some functionality. <laughs> That'd be a good use for it as opposed well, to. Well, that's actually an argument, too, for Aspectacular is that, you know, as the caller, you don't have to care about you're not modifying that source. But. With Post Sharp, you can apply aspects to like entire namespaces. You don't even have to have the source to it. You can apply namespace uh, aspects to code you, you know that you don't have, but that's not going to be you know you're going to pay. Right. That's um, not the community edition. So you are going to get you are going to take a performance hit. Uh, you know, so Post Sharp is going to do it at compilation time, and Aspectacular is going to do it at runtime. So you're going to take a hit. Um, yeah. So yeah. Okay. Cool. They, they 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 both solve the same problem, just different ways of getting to it. All right. So then my number three <laughs> is Win Merge, and anybody who's had to deal with large code uh, large code bases and you make changes to files and you you don't necessarily know what the changes were, um, you need a tool to be able to help you diff files. And WinMerge is Windows only, but it is actually a pretty outstanding tool on mm. Windows that's free. You I can see compare. A fight happening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, so <laughs> this one is free, and and you can compare directories. You can compare files. It has all kinds of options. It's even got plugins that are pretty outstanding. One so you don't just use diff at the command line. What's wrong with you, man? Yeah. Uh huh. Um, so one of the things that I do like about WinMerge is if you use Seven Zip, it has a plugin for it so that you can actually have it export the files that were different to a zip file, and then that way, if you need to do like a diff set somewhere else, you could just take a zip file. So there's a lot of neat little features built into it, and the fact that it's free and and is actually a very stable, um, well done tool. That's that's one of mine. Yeah, um, it's all right, I guess. Uh, <laughs> uh, so my next, you, you mentioned seven zip. Uh, my next uh, favorite is uh, Renrar. It's awesome. You can zip stuff up. It's really efficient, and people love when you send them RAR files, don't they? Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, I'm totally kidding. Don't send me a RAR file ever. Wait, Please what? stop. If if you guys have ever sent me a RAR file, just know that I, I kind of hate you a little bit. Like, don't I don't you, want. Don't Rin you just Rar. imagine like you should have a little uh, dinosaur as the logo? Yeah, absolutely. Ah. Like no one uses RinRAR anymore. If you, they used it, then Windows would have built it in. It's just like WinZip. You know, you know, Seven on. Zip will actually unzip a, a RAR I'm file. I'm not installing WinZip or Seven Zip either. Dude, come Seven on. Zip is so much faster than than Windows Compress. Knock knock. <laughs> 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 Who's there? Uh, 1997. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Right click, compress, right click, extract. So slow. Okay. Anyway, my real tip is PowerShell. Uh it's it's right there if you're using Windows. <laughs> it's a really nice utility to to get familiar with. It's something you end up okay. like see if you go dog on him for this. But you're really your favorite is gonna be like, I like the built in utility. <laughs> it's really nice. There's so much you can do with PowerShell. I mean, <laughs> just <laughs> restarting. Are you guys kidding me? With a PowerShell? <laughs> well, then, then my favorite should be Windows because you could do so much with it. Actually, mine's Explorer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm going to start doing some PowerShell tips then because you guys obviously <laughs> don't understand the power <laughs> and the beauty. Uh, go on. Right, go on sorry, we, we've utility. hijacked this thread here. So <laughs> It's so nice. It's uh, I it's use it so for all sorts in. of things. It's It's got code completion and so much better than bash i'm sorry i hate to bash on bash but oh my god the code completion alone the what? consistency it returns objects rather than strings none of that said awk crap 
when I'm just trying to do yeah, something yeah. basic. It's great for generating input, massaging output, and it's really good for code generation. Bash too. has ran the internet for how many years now? You want a dog on it? Uh, you oh, know, wait, because it was built in 1980. We should stay with it. That's right. <laughs> hey, it's fantastic. That's why. <laughs> yeah. It, um, they just found like the first bug in it. How long? So, Bash and WinRAR deserve a special place at the top of the trash heap. <laughs> Granted. And it should be garbage collected immediately. <laughs> and PowerShell belongs in the, the other collection with all the other built-in utilities. Hey, one of these days, Microsoft is going to make it the <laughs> command line. <laughs> By default, CMD. Dude, my favorite is FileMan.exe. <laughs> 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 so apparently nobody came into this knowing they were going to be highly scrutinized yeah. for their picks. I'm judging both of you. <laughs> the rest of the show will oh, not go smoothly. Awesome. Uh, All right, we're we're on a downhill path. Yeah, so um uh, we're going to take a break real quick. Please, again, if you guys get a chance, if you remember when you get out of your car or when you head home from work, whatever, do please get on, leave us a review, drop us a line, or, or come join us at, at on Twitter at Coding Blocks. So um, definitely, again, we always appreciate it. So please do take the time to do that. Yeah, like we said before, you know, we we really love and appreciate the reviews that you guys give us, both in like iTunes and Stitcher, um, or if you have another favorite place that you're uh, you know leaving review, feedback to, you know, let us know that too. We'd like to know that. And like we said before, you know. Spread the word, man. You know, tell tell a couple friends, you know, about the show. And for anyone that you don't like, tell three friend, three people you don't like about the show. And uh, yeah, help spread the word. Yep. So back to our regularly scheduled program. All right. All right. Number two. Two. I think I've I think I've mentioned this one before, but there is a tool that I use on Windows called Con Emu, and it stands for Console Emulator. Another and, console app. Man, is this one I, built into the operating system? No, you actually have to go down <laughs> this one. Why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> I'll tell you a couple of reasons why this one makes my list. And it's the first and probably most important for me is you can full screen it. Like in Windows, you cannot full screen the command line. I don't know if you can PowerShell or nope. not. See, and dude, that alone is enough to just send me over the edge. Are we talking about, you know, if you, you if can't you hit that go into maximize. your PowerShell properties and you change your layout to maximize the width and the, the yeah. rows and the columns? Well, that's what you well. got to do in, in the command prompt, right? You have to go in there. You have to and know how PowerShell. wide and how tall it is. That, yeah. Dude, that's ridiculous. I think you they can, fixed it in Win 10. You can hit the maximize button on the window thing and have a full screen console. All right, so that's good all in itself. But let's say that, like, you two guys who... Who like PowerShell or, or Git Bash or any of these other things? You can also instantiate a new tab and tell it which console you want to load. So it could be Sigwin, it could be Git Bash, it could be PowerShell, it could be Command. So it actually takes those in, brings it into its own little world, and you can have one window with multiple tabs open and use to different rule them all. and different consoles. And honestly, I mean. It, it's so nice if you've got Git open in one thing, but you're doing some copies or whatever in another tab to just be able to do those in groups and not and not have to have multiple windows spread all over your all over your interface. So that is that's one of my favorites. All right, I only like if it if it's blue like PowerShell. You could probably do that. Okay, <laughs> it looks like hey, Win Ten's gonna fix it all, man. <laughs> what about Win Nine? <laughs> uh, don't get me started. <laughs> All right, so my next tool is Agent Ransack. So this is a great tool for searching. Uh, there's a paid and a free version. I, th- I think the paid version is actually called File Locator Pro or something. Um, but anyway, it's really nice. It does some really cool caching. So if you're searching large um, sets of files a lot, then it's really fast. It, it also lets you do regex, which is really nice. So um, if you're looking for things in project files or you know doing all sorts of fun stuff it it, um just got a really nice user interface if you're not using something like git bash and grep (laughs) or find (laughs) find's really slow Uh, i feel like you guys need some linux commands here (laughs) (laughs) all right so my number two is istat menus wait when did you purchase this uh every time they come out with a new version no but wait what was the original purchase God, I've been using it for years. 
Okay. Like every time they come out with a when they come out with a new version, I'm upgrading. Okay. Yeah, it, it's awesome. It's uh, you can find it from Bajango. Um, it's a. So I like to okay. So we've talked about before in the past that you know, uh, that I use a Mac, and I think we've hinted around that we all are sitting around here with Macs at the t- desk. But I've had this question happen a lot of times when people will see my menu bar <clears throat> on my Mac and they'll see like all these cool little things that are happening across the top where I can see all the stats of like, you know, what the temperature of various parts of the machine are and the IO on the on the SSD or the you know, memory utilization or CPU utilization, network utilization, like all these crazy things that are happening. And they're like, man, that's really cool. What is doing that? And it's this nifty little app made by Bajango called iStat Menus. And I'm telling you, it is fantastic. Do you like it better than Spin Rank? Mm. I definitely use it more than anything like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, because because it's on my machine every day, you know, you boot up and there it is, right? So, you know, I mean, and you can also like see like fan speeds and you can change the fan speeds if you if you really wanted to. That's what actually got me into it the first time was back in like 2006. Uh, you know, some of the Mac Pro laptops back then, um, you really wanted to tinker with the fan speeds in order to get it to play nice. And uh, um, so I was looking for like different apps that would allow me to control the fan speeds and set different profiles. So that that's how long I've been a fan of this guy. It's been like since way back then. Um but yeah, you, you you can see all kinds of cool little details about it. And now the latest version for Yosemite, um, you know, it can tell you apps that are conserving or consuming too much uh, power. You know, so uh, yeah, that was one of the Yosemite features. You can do stats on like uh, if you are on a laptop, it can tell you how many cycles your battery has already been through. It can tell you the current health of the battery, what the amperage of the battery is versus what the um, supposed amperage is supposed to be on the battery. Um. Yeah, it's just wicked. Cool. How much is this thing? I want to say for like a five, uh, a five computer license, it's like twenty five bucks, and okay. then the renewal every year is like, or well, not every year, uh, whenever they come out with a new version, the renewal is like fifteen bucks. Okay, something like that. But it it is absolutely fantastic. Cool. And now we're moving the to the number top. ones. Yep. So uh, on the I'll top start. forty. So beyond compare is like Windif, but way better. It's well, like forty dollars like merge. Better. Win merge is that <laughs> what we're talking about here? Whatever this name. I don't. I don't have room <laughs> in my brain for number twos. Wait, does <laughs> it? Know? Does it use Seven Up? The first losers <laughs> Seven Up. <laughs> does it have a plug in for Seven Up? That's all I need to know. <laughs> seven Up. No one even knows what Seven Up. <laughs> this is a Sprite House. <laughs> <laughs> we're in atlanta you know coke products <laughs> all right so tell us why beyond compare is so great so it's beautiful. well first it made number one well first of all it's cross-platform so boom oh really yep absolutely okay. it works fantastic in mac and linux oh i thought you meant windows 8 and 7 uh, <laughs> it supported sftp way back in the day which is how i initially got started with it, and i just kept going with it it's got a lot of really nice tools and rules that you can set so if you can say um do this di- big diff between two projects uh do rules based or binary based or include these exclude those it's just got a really nice interface for that and also for saving sessions so you can keep coming back to these diffs for you know like repeated type task things it's definitely my ftp um program as well and i think it's like 39 dollars, so it's just really nice and it's so much prettier than when whatever <laughs> okay i'll give you the cross platform <laughs> oh, but <win> whatever <laughs> <laughs> But no seven up integration. <laughs> that's a that's a doubter. That is. All right, yours. All right. <clears throat> so since since we're all picking consoles, I'm gonna pick my favorite, which is the Git Bash. Which uh, if you're not already using Git, you, a you should be. You really should be. But um, this is my favorite tool. You can just Google it. We'll have links to all of, all of these tools in the show notes. But um, it's y- you need to have some. Uh, you know, some being familiar with Linux or Unix type commands will definitely be, uh, will be helpful because everything, including your path is going to be treated, you know, Linux like, and it's going to come with its own set of, uh, Unix commands available for windows. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely my favorite way to, 
to Git. So do you add Git to your Windows path, or do you just use the Sysadmin window? Um, so I forget like when you you talk about like when you do the install and there's like these three options. Yeah. And one of them, I think the one that I do does end up adding it to the path if I remember right. It's definitely the middle option, and I don't remember what. I've kind of gotten like numb to it, and I'm just like click the middle. Right. So you um, like this better than <laughs> Sigwin, huh? So oh, so this is a great question. Thank you. So I was a huge fan. One B. <laughs> I was a huge fan of Sigwin. Actually, you brought it up um, <laughs> back in the day, but but now this is like simplified it greatly. Um, so I mean, Sigwin is great, and you can definitely do a lot more with it, right? So for those who aren't familiar with Sigwin, that's uh, um, a console that where you can selectively decide what unix tools you want and you can add or remove them as you go along and so it's really nice and there's a whole suite of mirrors out there that are hosting different packages for it and it's really awesome and that was the way that i i used git for the longest period of time and was sold on it and and even when git bash came around i'm like yeah no i got no time for that but uh the simplicity of git bash sold me on it to where i didn't have to worry about um you know, using anything else to, to, you know, interact with it. And it had the majority of the Git commands that I wanted to use anyways. So yeah. All right. Git bash one out. Cool. All right. And there was a recent update, you know, because of the, uh, there might've been, you know, an exploit found in Git. (laughs) Might've been. Maybe. Uh, I'm actually surprised nobody picked Vim, but whatever. (laughs) Uh, Cause I'm sure that wouldn't start a flame war anywhere. Uh, all right, so my number one pick is actually Parallels for Mac. So I do, even though I do .NET programming, I like to do it on a Mac. And this kind of ties back into my screen flow suggestion. So when I've recorded like the videos that I've put up on uh, youtube.com slash coding blocks, that was done using Parallels so that I was running Visual Studio or SQL Management Studio inside the VM, um, just like any other mac application in its own window and then and then i record it with ScreenFlow, and so it allows me to actually do any kind of programming still use all my mac utilities use my mac itself which i love this computer and it's fantastic so um there's another piece of software out there called vmware fusion i've had a chance to work with both of them and i prefer parallels myself i haven't done any performance testing it just seems to be a little bit smoother and integrates a little bit better for me I think for those that have, though, if I remember right, they they were pretty close. I mean, it wasn't yeah. until you got into, like, specific, uh, like, it was graphics that were more often than not going to be gaming and deciding factors, which I was like, man, if you're going to game inside of a VM, you've oh, already no. got issues. Yeah, like, go to boot camp, doing? right? I mean, if you're going to do that, put a boot camp partition on there and just go well, straight Well, that's a great thing Windows. that if you're not already aware of for either uh, Parallels or uh, VMware Fusion, since you brought it up, you're 1B. Yep. Um <laughs> <laughs> you you can uh you can you know use a boot camp partition in either one of these so you can have the the um luxury of when you need to boot directly off the raw hardware you can boot windows in its own uh you know or directly off of the hardware instead of being in a virtual machine but for those other percentage of times where it can be in a virtual machine and you don't you know you're not uh bothered by that then you can just run it from uh you know, parallels or VMware inside of OS 10 and, and, you know, still access the same disk and same resources. Yeah. And it opens just like any other application on the, on the machine, which is why I really like it. Because like I said, I can do the screen recording. I can bounce back and forth between visual studio. I can go into, you know, whatever. So, um, it's, it's a pretty excellent, uh, piece of software and usually you can get it on sale for pretty cheap. So you can snapshot and roll back too, right? Um, you cannot do that if it's a boot camp partition. Okay. But if it's just a pure VM, you can. So you could, yeah, I mean, because it's basically just file on the disk, right? So if I finally hit up that Canadian pharmacy and I, I catch something. <laughs> uh, Correct. Just curious. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not that I'm considering it. So All right. Um, so that's it for our individual top five. So now we are moving on to round two, which are the tools we all like. All right. You want to kick us off with number five? All right. So number five, we've mentioned it at least once on previous shows. I think twice, technically. Yeah, maybe. Um, so Pluralsight. Uh, if 
it, there's probably not a resource that any one of us use more as far as if we've got to learn something or learn about something quickly. This is probably the first place we go, right? I I mean, we've talked before well, about... Well, if we're being, like, just to be clear here, you know, to, to the listener, we are excluding some of the, like extremely common things like Google doesn't count. Right, right. No, this is this is I don't know, you're Stack picking overflow up, doesn't count. Right. You're not looking for a specific how do I do this type thing. It's more about, hey, I'm looking at a new language or I'm looking at a new technology. I need the ins and outs of it pretty quick, right? This is the first place we probably all go before we get a book on, you know, deeper dives into the subject. So Yeah, and, you can gauge how deep do you want to go in the topic. Right. So Plural Sight is probably I mean, it made number five on our list, and that's only because some of these other things we recommend, we just love that much. So uh, anything in this top five that we all say, they're pretty highly recommended. Yep. And number four, you got to have a great text editor. We've got uh, Notepad++ or Slash Sublime here. Uh, I myself am a Sublime fan. It's got tons of great plugins, a, a million and a half shortcuts that do really weird, awesome things. And, I love uh, the I love the view of the the overview. I don't even know where they call it in Sublime, but where you can see like the entire document over on the right. Oh yeah, the map oh, yeah. view, and yep. you can just like scroll over that. I love that view in Sublime. That is fantastic idea. I wish more uh, editors had something like that. Yeah, I like you can open directories too, which is really nice for working on sets of files. I don't yep. know if Notepad Plus Plus supports that, but it's got. I use a, mark, a Markdown plugin too, so kind of every time I save, it generates a, a formatted rich text document for me, which is really nice. Oh, that was the tip you were talking about. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and you know we've mentioned uh, for Notepad Plus Plus. I mean, there's a lot of great plugins for each of these, but uh, for Notepad Plus Plus, we've mentioned specifically the Poor Man's uh, T SQL formatter, which is an awesome little utility in uh, Notepad++. And Notepad++ is free. Yeah. Sublime so, is not. It's like 80 bucks or something like yeah, that. Yeah, something like that. I think it was like $79. And, and here's the thing. Like, uh, Sublime 3 is out in beta, at least, I believe. Forever, yeah. And there, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it just kind of annoys you. Just like things. Gmail. Right. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come out of labs at some point. But, I mean, both of them have fantastic uh, plug-in managers, so you can just go to a plug-in area and search and you'll find some stuff. I I got to say the templating system in Sublime, like the shortcuts are just outstanding. You can type five keystrokes and have a whole page of code. Um but both both excellent excellent resources. All right, so weighing in at number 3, we uh we recently talked about this one in uh I think this might have been like a tip of the week one that Alan brought up if I recall. But uh it comes in so handy and we use it so often we just thought it deserved to mention, which is the Remote Desktop Connection Manager, which just dun, 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 got updated. So maybe so, that log out button <laughs> is yeah, fixed. Version 2.7 was just released uh, November 18th. And I think I think we actually talked about this in the show uh, you know, as a tip. After that, so I think that that release actually snuck in before we even realized it was there. But yeah, it's a great little tool. You can have um, a bunch of uh, uh, you know connections to different servers, and you can have them all grouped up, and you can have their credentials all roll up into a parent if you need to. There's That's there's a nice. lot of really cool things about it that you can do with it. Um, you know, if you do have multiple servers and you make uh, connections to them, uh, them simultaneously, you can keep them all docked together and just uh, you know click through them and, and see the different servers one at a time, or you can click up a higher level to a folder and you can kind of get an overview of all of those as to like what was going on on each of those, uh, or if you need to undock them and you know you can go full screen on them. It's just it's a really nice little way to manage uh, a lot of if you have, if you need to manage a bunch of different servers, this is a great little tool for that. And you can open groups too. It's nice. You got yes. like five web servers. You right click, open group, and they'll all pop up. Yeah, yeah. I haven't tried the the right click log off yet though. Yeah. Since uh, version two point seven. That was a terrible. I haven't been bug. daring daring enough to try that yet. <laughs> I gotta believe that that was turn that was uh, fixed though, because like one of the big features about this one though had to do with um, uh, VMs connecting to VMs hmm. too, which I haven't really had a uh, use to play around with that yet to see how that's uh how that how that works out but cool yeah so. very nice well you know though they say if uh, you're remote remoting into machines and your automation is broken or it's just 
not feasible for you to set up automation. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. That's not realistic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're logging into two boxes, uh, you know, when it's every couple of weeks and, you know, your automation is not broken. You're just being pragmatic. Yes. But it's something I like saying and turning my nose up at. So. <laughs> That's your snobbery. Yeah, I passed it on. Now you can do it too. All right. Okay, who wants to take number two? I think Outlaw's got to do it. Yeah, yeah. I okay. Mean, he, he's kind of in love with this one. Yeah, I, I'll definitely do this one. Um, if you haven't already heard my voice enough, I'll talk about this one. So my favorite, uh, let's see, browser plugin for every browser, favorite website, favorite mobile app on every platform, LastPass. So if you're not already using a password manager, A, you're crazy. Absolutely. And, and the world we live in right now, you should absolutely be using a password manager. If it's not LastPass, pick one of the competitors, but you should be using one of them. But this one happens to be my favorite. Um, like I said, it's available on every platform. They have a plugin on every browser, on every platform. Um, <clears throat> it can, obviously, it's storing your passwords, but it's doing it off securely. You know, as far as what LastPass has, they only have encrypted blobs they don't they don't have your data in the clear so from a trust no one type perspective they don't um, even have your password right right as i'm saying like they, they they know nothing they can't decrypt anything and um uh you know if you need to generate new passwords they've got the generator in there to uh, help you out with that too it, it's just a great little way great little utility and app so that you can have your passwords on any of the devices that you need them but you, they can be secure passwords, and you can access them securely too. So another thing that I like to do is on my machines, like I'll only have um, certain machines are trusted. Majority of the machines that I touch are not, and so I'm always prompted to log in. But I'm also a big fan of two-factor authentication. So um, you can use uh, like, a, um, like a Google Authenticator app, uh, or something similar to that, as well as a YubiKey for the multi-factor authentication. Um, but yeah, it, it's fantastic. And so, just to expand on that, because I, I mean, oh, this is I still didn't even list all the features. This is actually one thing that's uh, if you are using a password manager and you haven't talked to people in your family about this, you probably should because it'll shock you how many people in your family use the same password for their bank. Their email. There's everything. a good chance if you're listening to this, your parents use your name as their password. Yeah. So I mean, this <laughs> is this is literally something that you really should bring up. But one of the other things I wanted to talk about is it's free to use. So if you have a smartphone, if you have, you know, your desktop computer, like you said, there's plugins. Those are free to use in your browsers. Um, however, on your smartphone, you can go straight to LastPass.com and log in and do it. If, though, you want to be able to use their application and make your life so much easier to where it will log into things for you, you can pay $12 a year. And it's a dollar a month. Yeah, I mean, seriously, a dollar a month. To You're going to spend more than that at Starbucks. Yeah, and, and it will save you from being potentially like your life getting turned upside down. Oh, there's so many great things. Like, uh, so I was there's gonna a security check. Well, there's also the thing that we use oh, is yeah, I was gonna mention that sharing one. passwords. So if you pay for the twelve dollar premium account, yep. it's it's the cheapest premium thing I know of, right? You uh, don't you have probably to spent share, more on Candy Crush. You don't have to pay to be a recipient of the share. Right. So you so, can share it without you ever seeing the password. So yeah, so yep. so I could have a password to some website and I could share it with a family member or a friend. And I can decide if they see the password, if they can make if they make changes to the password, I can make sure that those changes are reflected back to me. Um, it, it's a really great feature. But again, in order to um, share that password, you have to be paying the uh, $12 a year subscription. But I do, I, I don't want to belabor this one too long, but seriously, you would be shocked how many people, your friends, your family, Secure don't time. know good practices around passwords. Like, I mean, I just talked to a family member the other day, and and his password's the same for every one of his accounts. All that means is some hacker out there is going to find the site that's the easiest to hack, and then they're going to go take that information and plug it into every site on the planet, see if they can get in. Well, for so, a long time there in the in the um, the dictionaries, monkey was like the m most common password. I thought password was. 
Was uh, well, it monkey? I think the ones that weren't password. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, again, uh, our number two favorite, and it, it might have made it to number one, if not four. Well, let's all say it at the same time. One, two, resharper. Resharper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I bet no dirty. one saw that one coming, yeah, right? That's dirty. <laughs> so the only reason this should not make number one is because it's not cheap, right? <sighs> that, that's the only drawback to it. But it's so worth it, though. I mean, like, okay, so... Okay, it's expensive. You say three fifty, right? Three fifty for is that? Hold on. If you were a carpenter, and you had to go out and you needed to buy a miter saw, you rent it. <laughs> <laughs> what you got? Thirty day trial. <laughs> uh, <is> there... <laughs> and then you reformat. Oh, were, you, were you going somewhere with this? You reformat I, once no, a month. I was right? going to say that, like you know, depending on yeah you know, what uh, you. Know, your profession is there are, are there plenty of professions where like you need a good tool for the job to help you get it done yeah. this is one of those so I, you know that that 350 price that you're talking about that's you know, i don't even think it was that hold, much. hold on let me but let me take that back up front i thought it was more like uh 150 so no it depends on whether it's for a company or for an individual so let me take that back i said it wrong so resharper for a company to buy for somebody is 250 if you're an individual and you want to get it, it's 149 Yeah, that sounds bad. And if you want to get the ultimate, which includes ReSharper, ReSharper C++, JetBrains.net profilers, and the code coverage tool, which both Joe right. and Outlaw have gushed yeah, over. We've, we've talked about dot .peak and dot .cover. That's $100 more. So here's the deal. And Joe, You've got to be doing a lot of C++ development, though, I think, for Ultimate to be worthwhile. No, nah, because that's the only one thing in there is that. The other one are the profilers and the coverage tools. So you're basically paying $100 for dot .cover and um, a memory thing, I believe. <clears throat> no, a ReSharper Ultimate was uh, like $600. Uh, no, not for individual. That's what I'm saying. Oh, right, right, right. So, right. so Again, like I think we should kind of tell some of our favorite features about this. Um, I think mine is when I was learning Link, um, the fact that it'll put like a little tool thing out there to the left, and if you write like a for loop, it'd be like, "Hey, do you want to turn this into a Link statement?" It was a great way for me to learn uh, Link queries. Yep. I, I mean, like seriously, that granted, that's probably not the most useful thing that it has, but it was. It was definitely good for me learning the the ins and outs because I could look at my before and the after and just keep control Z and control shift Z to see what changed, right? Yep. Well, I got a good analogy for what I my, my favorite thing about it. Have you ever heard the horror story about going into a hotel room with a black light? <laughs> That's how I feel about ReSharp. But you look at some code, you know, you, like you just start and a new like job, you see whatever. all these little hashes off to the right. Well, before you try to install ReSharp, you like look at something you're like, all right, you know, whatever, it's all right. And you install ReSharp, and then there's like pink all over down the left side. And you're like, oh, what is this monster? Oh, I didn't even know all these variables aren't used. Yada yada. It's like it's like the black light in the hotel room. Yeah, that's that, that's, that's an awesome analogy. I, I was actually going to mention like uh, scrubbing. Some of the code cleanup features are awesome. Yeah, uh, you know. Ability test like to do, um, yeah, the test runner, uh, finding replaces, you know, across uh, across your files or your solutions. Oh, fixed uh, namespaces. Yeah, 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 that. But I was thinking like, um, if you wanted to rename something, right, and it'll just like find and replace it throughout all your files, because you know, you could you could try to do it just by, uh, <clears throat> you know, doing a, a a a find and replace as text. But that's not necessarily going to be as safe because maybe your use of the word string might have been in a uh, you know inside of a string or, or part of a string, and it wasn't actually the the type that was meaning to be uh, renamed, right? I mean, that's a horrible example. But well, no, uh, Visual Studio actually supports that one now, which actually brings a, f a funny point. It's like a lot of things that ReSharper did. Visual Studio has been kind of slipping in, and of course, ReSharper has been slipping in new features too. Yep. But what's funny is a lot of times they'll say something cool that ReSharper does, and somebody else says, oh yeah, Visual Studio's already got them. Like, that's where it came from then. Yeah, it pretty much is. I mean, uh, one of the key examples is if you're in an older version of Visual Studio and you need some JavaScript support, dude, ReSharper will give it to you. Um, however, the newer versions of Visual Studio do a pretty fine job with JavaScript. So, um, yeah, it is true. Visual Studio is slipping some of it in, but some of it's just not as good. I mean, um, 
Yeah, and ReSharper has got its own compiler. It's really interesting how, how it kind of works, and it actually kind of compiles your code. It keeps a, a copy around, and so it gets to see, you know, what's not used or, um, you know, there's also different conventions, you know, where variable names, stuff like that, um, unused code. I keep saying that, but it's really awesome when you open up a file and you say, oh, there's three variables that aren't used. Why aren't they used anymore? Yeah. yeah. And, and even for, I, I would say especially, I mean, we're experienced programmers, but for uh, people who are fairly new to the programming world, like a lot of times you'll see a bunch of if else's, you know, where you're assigning to a variable. It'll be like, hey, turn this into a ternary. And so it, it will kind of, it, it, it will lead people towards doing consistently better code as you move along as well. So uh, th there's just a ton of features in there. I love when you see um, condition will never be met. So it's like either you never set the variable away from false or something, or else you're checking if a non-noble type is, is equal to null. And you don't see that sort of thing normally with the compiler. You don't even get warnings for it. But, yeah, uh, it just ignores you know. it. Yeah, it's nice. I mean, I mean, we could go on and on about it, but... I think it's fairly safe to say if you're doing this as an individual, 150 bucks. If you're if you're making decent money as a programmer, this will probably turn you into an even better programmer. Yeah. So. Agreed. All right. So we got we got a few minutes left. Yeah. So how to make a good tool? Yeah. Want to talk a little bit about like what are some of the things in common with these tools and maybe some things that we don't like. But the first thing I wanted to mention is that if you really want me to love your tool, then you need to support chocolatey. Which means I need to be able to support to install your app via command line, which does not mean it has to be free. It just means it needs to have something like uh, Sublime. You can install via Chocolate. You just have to insert your um, key afterwards. I'm not sure if ReSharper su um, supports it, but a lot of other things do that are paid. But there are still ways around that. So if you can make it happen, support Chocolatey. Cool. So, uh, you know, Choco install, sub it up. <laughs> yeah and uh, you know, actually along that lines uh, i'm really big on the free trials like you know i deal with a lot of computers i reformat often i do all sorts of crazy stuff a lot of times like beyond compare you know i, I install that tool all the time but i don't always want to go look up the key that's in my email somewhere in order to uh, hook it up right now you know i just want to use the tool real quick and then later at my convenience i'll you know pop in my license so I definitely like having that trial available. I do it all the time. Yeah, with I, ReSharper. I do that a lot too. I run that thing for 30 days before I type in the license that I've owned for six months. Yes, ReSharper right. is a 30 day trial as well. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, who had this next one? Uh, this is, I think, I, I think these are pretty much like all of Joe's rants. <laughs> really, <laughs> just to be honest, I don't like icons in tools, especially when there's no text and I can't control F for it. So if it's like a Windows app, like, please put the text. Don't make me hover to figure out what the hammer means. So I like to be able to that see things. That means Thor comes down. Yeah, it probably does. And I like to be able to Google for stuff, too. So put some t some stuff up there. And even along that line, this is definitely a rant. I want to be able to copy and paste out of your application. So don't show me a bunch of text in like a, you know, a window, a WPF app that I can't copy An and alert paste box. Out of. Oh, man. Oh, those man. are the worst. Oh, don't, it's like, especially if it's like a GUID or something, I'm like trying to type the error code, like 18811F, like, no, <laughs> no, copy paste guys. Oh, Microsoft is horrible, horrible about that. If you get a Windows error, it throws it up there and it's like, hey, you need to go to this site and it's like 5,000 characters long. It's you like, never ah. controlled C in this? You can't, you can't, you can't highlight text. No, the ones I'm talking about, no. believe me. No, no, no. You no. just control C the window. Huh? Really? Yeah. You didn't know this? Really? Like, like some of these windows, <clears throat> so some of the windows that you're talking about, and not necessarily all of them, but uh, sometimes you'll get like an error message or some random window will pop up, and you just, you, you're in this little window, this little modal it's window, right? And it, and it just has an OK option or an OK cancel or something like that. Just control C and then go over to a notepad and control V. And it'll, whatever that window was, boom, you get the text you representation. You gotta be kidding me. Nice. That's much better than me taking screenshots. Yeah, uh, which I've done. That's usually what it is. Yeah. Interesting. I'll try that. Uh, that's been around for a long time. Well, this though. shouldn't be hard to replicate. We can probably throw open air in Windows pretty quick, right? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that is right. <laughs> Could right. not run Seven Up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, nice. uh, Joe had another one here that I thought was kind of interesting. So. He was talking about copying data in SQL Server. And if you've ever done that, it's a right click on the database, all tasks, export data. Well, you're typically doing the same thing every time. 
but you got to click 50 check boxes to do it every single time. And, and I actually agree with this. Give the, give the user some ability to say, Hey, make these my defaults or save this particular configuration that I just did, because I don't want to have to go check these 50 check boxes again, just to do the same operation that I do every day, 50 times. So, um, you know, ability to save common steps. That one's that, that one. Uh, so macros is what you want. Not macros. You want, you want tools that have macros. Uh, not necessarily a macro. Just hey, this is the configuration. This is my default configuration. I want to. I want to generate tables. I want to drop tables. I want to do this. When I run I this, I don't next think step, dropping tables yeah. should be that quick. No, when you <laughs> when you create the script, right, to do the thing. But that's what I'm saying. Like when you check those options, you want those to stay there, right? So yeah, and like Beyond Khmer does a great job of this by letting you save sessions. So I can say. Diff this folder with this folder. Only show me JS files. Um, you know, use a binary comparison. Yeah, does WinMerge do that? <laughs> I bet and I can it save does. it off. So you know, by <laughs> yeah. uh, after a year on the computer, I might have you know five or six different compares kind of saved. I don't have to think about it where they are. I, you know, there's none of that cognitive dissonance. It's just click. All right, diff it out, you two. <laughs> hmm. Mine's free. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um. So another one. Honor the theme. If it's some sort of utility that's a plug-in to an existing application or if it's or if it's something else that you are using, you know, use what's there. Make make it look the same. Like it, uh, uh one that um an application that I used a while back that was Java, one thing that drove me crazy is it looked like a it Java, was Java. It looked like oh. a Java application. I wanted it to look like Windows. Like, you know, did you have to like open up a command prompt and, you know, start Java? Probably. I mean, it's been a while, but I, I don't know. It's just one of those things. Like if you're if you're on Windows 8, make it look like Windows 8. If you're on Windows XP, it should look like XP. You know, honor the operating system or the theme or whatever application you're in. You know, make it look somewhat consistent. Where uh, if you're trying to write it to be multi-platform? Figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Words of wisdom yes. by Alan Underwood. There we go. Um, all right. <laughs> all right. Who's got this one? Uh, just another one I had was um, writing the standard out and standard error. Not such a big deal for Windows tools, but uh, it's kind of annoying when things don't have a good way to output, so you can't really automate them. And also, really wanted to pitch for config files. Like being able to save things is nice, but even better is being able to take those files with like your keyboard shortcuts or your color scheme or whatever and be able to take that and port that to another computer is huge. All right, so speaking of config files. So, in other words, you're not a or, fan of the registry. Or shortcuts, no, I should say. I'm not a fan of the registry. Dude, if you build an application and it has a lot of functionality in it, please give me shortcut keyboard mappings. I do not like going through menus. I do not like doing those things. I want to be able to hit a key on my keyboard I or two or like three. I Sam I That's am. right. And don't make me take these hands off this keyboard. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> these hands were built for a keyboard. Give me <laughs> shortcuts. So, yeah, that's that's actually one of my big things is, and, and a lot of Windows things have that somewhat built in already where you can alt something to get a menu or something. But but having shortcut keys goes a long way to making an application usable, especially for programmers. Indeed. Yeah, so uh, what do you say? we got the new year coming up. We do. You wanna you wanna get into some resolutions? Uh, absolutely. I know uh, it's it's kind of like a double edged sword. You know, it's like by making a resolution, I'm pretty much guaranteeing that I'm not going to do it. <laughs> All right, I kind of like where we're going with this. <laughs> but part of me just likes also you know kind of getting organized and trying to think about it. You know, high level goals. So you know, maybe if I reach for the stars, I you know maybe I'll you know get somewhere. You will land okay. on the moon. Okay, Let, let's <laughs> let's hear your first one. All right, so for me, uh, <laughs> the first thing is I really need to stop whining about JavaScript. Okay, so this is the first thing you're not going to do this next year. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So this is a little backwards. January 1 is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess another way of phrasing this is just trying to get more in touch with my uh, UI side. So I need to focus more on UIs, and I know that it's uncomfortable for me, and uh, it's not something I'm particularly good at, but there's a lot of value to it. And I, I think maybe because I'm so bad at it, hopefully – that uh, spending a little more time thinking about it and working on it uh, would give me some pretty big returns. So, um, yeah, I'm going to try stop whining about JavaScript. I'm going to try to work with things like Unity and HTML5 and Windows app stores and stuff. 
stuff. Hey, it's it's not January first yet. <laughs> <laughs> so does this mean uh, Angular is in your future? Some Node.js maybe? Yeah, maybe. What kind of what kind of framework are we thinking about? Ember, Backbone. I think uh, I think Angular is interesting, but I'm also interested in. in oh, others. it's already been a week. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, uh, you know, WPF mobile stuff too is you know I count that, so it doesn't have to necessarily mean JavaScript, but it does mean I should stop whining about JavaScript. <laughs> All right. All right. You want to give one? Uh, are, we, are we doing these in a? Yeah, sure. I, I can. I can go. So, um, in the vein of of you know bettering myself and from an educational point of view, I I want to get into uh, Ruby and Rails development. I want to maybe not career wise, but definitely from you know my own kind of experience and and just expanding my own uh, you know breadth there. I, I'd like to. Uh, you know, put 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 Ruby in the toolbox. Do you have a specific app in mind? Nope, not n- nothing specific in it. it. Really, I just I you hear so much about it, and it's just one of those things that I, I honestly I feel guilty as long as it's been around, and I still haven't gotten around to it because you know, like in, at first when it, when it first came up, I'm like, eh, it's another fad, it won't last. And then you know, you know, a couple more years go by, and you're a like, decade later, yeah, crap, that thing's still around, huh? And it's got quite the following, and you know, yeah, like you hear nothing but awesome things about it. So finally, Except I'm for like, performance. <sighs> I mean. I, I okay well, but I've definitely heard that like in terms of being able to uh, turn things around fast. You yes, know, I've I've heard nothing but awesome things about it. So, you know, even if I don't do anything with it professionally, I would just like to better my own self by, um, you know, taking the time to uh, get to know it. You know, so you want it in the it. tool belt. So if you have yeah. the need for a lightweight web application that you need to get done fast and don't want to spend a lot of time with, yep. then exactly. you might want to go with Ruby on Rails. Yeah, and and you know it's supposed to follow. You know, Rails specifically is supposed to follow a lot of the you know best practices and patterns. So um, you know I, I like that. I mean we've done multiple uh, episodes now on patterns, and I'm sure there's going to be more to come because we haven't even come close to covering them all. But um, yeah, so there's a lot of good foundational kind of uh, principles about it that I that I like, and like I said, I already feel guilty about you know having overlooked it all these years, anyways. Yeah, and I didn't mean to diss it. You know, you can use it for larger projects too, but <laughs> no, it just sounded like that's where the the niche you were looking to fill. Oh, I mean, well, I mean, like you you say that about the larger apps. I mean, there's definitely some oh massive, some definitely you know. Uh, you know, large infrastructures that are right on the back of that. So, yep. Yeah. So mine is a little interesting is I want to create some sort of course. Uh, I've like thought, a golf course. Uh, not so much. Most of people course. go broke. Oh, uh, <laughs> it, it could be a race course on programming. Uh, so I, I don't know. I've been thinking about doing something on maybe angular or, um, I don't know. Maybe some other UI. Uh, maybe maybe XDJS. Maybe some C sharp stuff. I, I don't really know database. I mean, I like it all. So I've just been trying to think. I mean, we've done some blog posts here and there, and they've all been kind of you know piecemeal. We, we'll we'll throw one out there, and it, it's a one little piece of a puzzle somewhere, and we'll do another one. But I, I think a lot of times, like with uh, programmers, they have a hard time seeing what the whole picture is. Like uh, even if you started a new framework like Angular. One of the things that's not apparently clear to people who start these things are, what does the file structure look like when you're done, right? Like, you have this app. Well, all the all the examples online are, here, this is how you tie up or two-way bind a controller with something else, right? Well, well, where do these files go, and how do they tie together, and how does it all work? So... So pretty soon on plural side, I'll be watching one of your courses is I, what your, I don't your know goal about, is. I don't know. I, but it, I don't know. I, I've just been trying to think of things. So, I mean, if you guys, if there's anything that anybody's interested in, let us know. And, you know. Ruby. Can you do a course on Ruby? <laughs> I know where a good free one is at Code Academy. <laughs> so, um, it, and I mean, that's also one of the challenges too, right? There's tons of information out there. But this is just more for, I don't know, doing it. Because I enjoy, I enjoy doing this. We, we all enjoy helping people out. And, and this is just something that would be kind of fun. And I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. All right. All right. So another one for me is uh, I want to um, get more in the practice of, of writing more functional, kind of uh, a little bit um, more reactive type code. So I know a little bit about functional from you know reading Hacker News and Reddit, 
and uh, I definitely like a lot of things about it. I know I don't want to go full functional for a lot of reasons. But now, when you read Reddit for your functional or reactive stuff, like what kind of kittens are we talking about? <laughs> yeah, uh, different kind of Reddit. Uh, so uh, uh, slash r slash programming mentioned a little bit uh, earlier. So yeah, if you go there and uh, you know like everyone's going to be slamming comments around, it's full of trolls, uh, can be a really negative environment, and the only people that don't get any crap are like the Haskell and Erlang programmers, uh, of which there are in the real world probably like ten. So, uh, you know, the, and we are not that. about to go down in flames on this show, are we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not a show unless I say like 10, uh, you know, risky things. <laughs> but anyway, there's a lot, there's a lot of benefit to programming a functional style and I'd like to uh, reap some more of those benefits. Cool. All right. So, uh, another thing that I would like to be better at, I need to social better. I'm, I'm horrible about it. It, it's just, I don't want to see your life on Facebook. <laughs> I don't care. So you start an Instagram? But I need to try to be better at this thing. So who should I be Snapchatting to? You're going to no, say your name on the air? <laughs> it's not, it's just like, but any of the social platforms, like I just need to get better. I mean, I think like I'm probably, of all of them, I'm probably, I I'm not good at any of them. Like and, and by that, what I mean is it's just it's just like I'm not in the habit of caring enough to share like, hey, look at this meal that I'm eating right now, you know. So so like I don't have three billion tweets or you know uh, Facebook statuses or or thirty <laughs> or thirty <laughs> because and you want to fix this, but I need but I feel like I feel like I should get to this, but you know it's just that. Like even on Google Plus, right? Like it doesn't matter what the what the platform is on any of them. I'm just not as social as I probably should be because I feel like I feel like in this day and age, like it's not an option, right? Like you just you need to do it. Period. You need to you need to be on the various platforms and not just one, but you need to be on multiple of them. So you know, pick your few favorites, and uh, you know be better at it. And, and I just feel like because I'm so not interested in sharing the little minutia that happens in my day that, but yet other people do. And Hey, you know, good for you, those people that do. Cause sometimes, you know, you never know what's going to stick and become the next viral post. But you know, I, because I never throw that spaghetti against the wall, obviously nothing's going to stick. So. And there are a lot of benefits to social networking. Like, you know, it's nice to be able to ask, uh, you know, for a real world example of the visitor pattern and, you know, have someone, you know, throw one at you. So that, you know, that's really nice. And especially, um, in the, this kind of LinkedIn time of, you know, time of days, uh, it's nice to be able to kind of have that network there and working for you. So, yeah. And it always kind of feels awkward too. Cause like, um, you know, if somebody, you know, uh, messages me and then I'm like, well, I don't know how, like, how should I respond? Or like, if I message them, then I'm like, well, oh, I hope that didn't sound, did that come across right? You know, it's mm-hmm. just like, like in, like I go through this, like, you know, we've, we've joked around about my OCD before, about like, you know, it goes crazy when it comes time to social and it's just like, ah, I don't know what to do. Ah, all the words. Yeah. And next thing you know, it's like three weeks have gone by and, uh, you still owe mom an email. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, <laughs> oh God, especially like on to the emails. So like, you know, it's a good thing we don't get a lot of emails to coding, to comments at coding box rather than going through the, uh, the contact form because like if you're waiting on me to reply to some of those emails i'm gonna be like really bad about it i might like you might be lucky to be like get a thanks out of me like hey thanks hey. it's not because i'm trying to be rude or anything it's just like um i don't know maybe am i socially awkward i guess like you know no you are i think digitally you, you are know, digitally socially, socially awkward, awkward. Yes. yeah yeah so if we could coin a new term i am digitally socially awkward like yeah. he's dsa yeah. and by the way i really like that this is probably your kid's worst nightmare it's like dad's trying to use social media more yeah <laughs> <laughs> what could go wrong yeah this would be awesome it, it was funny trying to get him to actually open up some of his linkedin profiles like why well, you even have one dude you know, I just wanted to keep it to myself. I wanted to look at my own wall. <laughs> it's my stapler. <laughs> I look pretty. 
<laughs> All right. So my other resolution is I want to be better about creating content, um, especially for this. And so I'm going to try to make myself write either a blog post or do a video every month. So don't know what the topics will be, but you know, something that will help out with programming, learning stuff, whatever, but just being a little bit more diligent about it, because I think I did like maybe four this past year Mm -hmm. and it it, it just takes a lot of time. Oh my God. And so you have to set aside, like, I mean, anytime we write one of these things, like it spans multiple days. And so I I just want to make sure that I kind of stay on top of it because you know, it helps you guys out. It helps us out. It keeps, keeps the skills sharp. So that's pretty much what it boils down to. Yeah, and I have a lot of respect for content producers. You know, it's really easy to retweet or to, uh, you know, just kind of click like on that Facebook page. And it's really hard to make something put yourself out there, especially when there's so much good stuff and you're competing against the whole rest of the Internet. So I think it's really important to, to you know, try and do that. And I think you reap a lot of rewards from being a content producer. Or you get shot down, bang, bang. <laughs> that might happen, too. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, either which way. I, I might I might create some content, and I might not publish it anywhere. So. Yeah. And uh, I've got one more here. So I uh, ended up writing about this on our Facebook page, actually, which we don't keep up with very well. But you should still go friend us. Oh, are you waiting on me to do some socialing <laughs> on our Facebook page? Yeah, so uh, one thing I want to do is uh, stop saving things to my desktop on my computer. And really what, what I mean by that is I just need to be more digitally organized. And a big part of that for me is email categorization. So it's so easy to just kind of like I, I click on my... I help you break that habit. Yeah, what's that? I, I don't know about if this works for you, but like as far as like saving things to the desktop, just uh, like right click and, and turn off the ability to show anything on your desktop so you oh, only you see go. the background. Oh, but I don't actually go to my desktop to find this stuff. I still go through Explorer. It just yeah, gives me here. a place to dump. <laughs> same here. Yeah, but it, but really, I don't even use the, the desktop that much. The email is a bigger thing for me. It's so much easier on the phone to just like kind of slide, archive, slide, archive, slide, archive. And I search for something like I'm looking for my new egg order confirmation. And I find my confirmation. It's on page three after 150 uh, you know, pages worth of spam emails I never unsubscribed from. So I need to get better about kind of deleting stuff out of my email because I'm losing searchability and usability from it. Yeah, I hate that they did the archive. Good luck for you. (laughs) Yeah, I'm working on it. I have like 5,000 unread emails in my inbox. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, I like inbox zero, but it's tough to maintain. Yeah, I've been doing that and didn't even realize that was a thing, or I was doing it before it was a thing, and now yeah. I still do it. And I like having right. an action folders. So like, if there's an email I need to respond to, then take it out of that the inbox. So you know, the <sighs> inbox is that's crap. Place. No, 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 no. But if no. you leave it in the inbox, you guys, you then you go in there and you, like you just your mind just like spins flag through it. each email in there. Just flag it. Either either flag it or search. Why like this whole like Gmail years ago broke me of the whole folder categorization crap. Just search. Yeah, but see, I like that's to only why I have, have five thousand unread in my inbox. But like, I like to have zero in my inbox. So like, so if I'm looking it? for you know something I need to do or respond to, then I want to go to action. But by default, when I get a buzz in my pocket, I don't want to open it up and see the you know the twenty things I need to do by the end of this week because it stresses me out. It makes me think about things that I should be focusing on. You know, the drive through. Well, you know what's interesting, and this is funny. Like, I, I know I get the like the Twitter emails that come in. And I get the uh, various different emails that come in, like somebody subscribed, somebody wrote on this, whatever. Um, most of them are, you got retreated, you got favorited. That's just stuff that makes you feel good. But then if you don't immediately get rid of it, it just junks up your inbox, right? Yeah, you're going to see that email like 10 hundred times until you finally get rid of it. Right. And so, I don't know. That's the whole, that's my problem with email. And that's why I well, probably I mean, don't manage it well, because <clears throat> there's so much noise that comes through that I'm just like, whatever. But as far as like the inbox zero type uh you know, philosophy comes th- uh, is concerned. I, I'm not like setting aside, like some people have like, well, I will only read my email at this time in the morning oh, no. or in the afternoon, crap like that. Like I don't do that, but I definitely, you know, uh, like I said, without, without even trying to you know, adhere to some inbox zero type philosophy, I do end up having inbox zero only because like, you know, at the times when I have a moment, like if I'm standing in line at, you know, the, you know, for lunch or something like that, you know, then, uh, you know, I can, I can read through so that the, uh, you've been favorited or whatever, that, that random kind of crap that comes through, you know, that I should be better about responding to. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I can, I just read through it then. Right. Yeah. So, we all manage it differently. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. 
All right. Well, what do you say we wrap this one up with some tips of the week? Let's do it. Yep. All right. I guess I'm going first. So um, I read an interesting study a while back, and I've kind of been thinking about it uh, ever since. But uh, basically said something to the effect of people being more honest in the morning. So um, now that you know that, you can schedule your day accordingly. So you can uh, Wait, write... we're recording at night. Yeah, so everything we've said is a lie. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, like maybe you're more prone to over-promising at night. So maybe you should uh, save off and uh, write that status email in the morning. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> All right. All Save right. yourself some trouble. So just schedule accordingly. Nice. Okay, so uh, my tip of the week, and and I'll give full credit where credit's due, but I cannot, I won't be able to pronounce his name, but I'll, I'll pronounce his Twitter handle, uh, HMemCopy. He, uh, he tweeted a message about ReSharper's greedy brace feature. I didn't even realize this existed, and apparently neither did he, but... We'll include a link to his tweet where he uh, shows a working example of this. But basically what happens is, let's say you have a block of code and you want to put that inside of uh, like any kind of other block, like a for each or a while or a try or whatever it might be. And so you write your, you write your um, like in his example here that he, he shows in the tweet, you write your try statement and you stub out the, uh, the curly braces, right? And... In the past, maybe you would either uh, copy and paste the block of code that you wanted to be inside of that block, or you would delete the closing brace and then move it down to the bottom and then let your IDE or ReSharper automatically uh, reformat everything accordingly. But instead, what you can do is go to your closing brace and then Control-Alt-Shift up or down, depending on the direction you need to go, uh, if you've got too much, and you can move the brace down and it'll reformat the code in line as you're going. And it's called the greedy brace op- uh, operation. That's it cool. is awesome to see this in action. Hmm. All right. So my tip of the week is this is more just for people that may just skim over things, but in link, uh, a lot of times you get a list of, of objects and you want to sort that information. Well, a lot of people probably just use the order by because they're used to like link to SQL or something. Well, that creates a copy. So if you had two megs of RAM, take it up. Now you got four megs. Um, one of the cool things that you can do is you can use link sort, and that will sort a list in place. So or or uh, an enum or whatever it is. Um, but then that will that should eat up less memory on your heap. It may not perform quite as fast as doing the order by because you're literally just um, creating a copy and sorting it on the fly as opposed to having to shuffle things around in the same collection. But it can save space on the heap, and it is nice if you're trying to order a collection that you're going to use further down the page without having to have multiple variables exist. And uh, by default, it uses quick sort algorithm, and I found a nice little link that had a great little animation to show you how the quick sort works. And if you want to go into the implementation details of that, you can look at that too. So that's actually from Wikipedia. There's actually that that animation. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, well, I, I believe there's uh, similar animations in Wikipedia's uh, article on sorting algorithms. Too. Oh, very cool. Yeah, it, it's it's excellent stuff. So that link will be in the show notes, and that is my tip of the week. Very nice. So, yep. So uh, this month we talked about some tools and uh, also our New Year resolutions uh, on the technical side. So uh, the things that we're not going to do, right? Uh, I don't know. So we'll does see. that mean we still get to whine about JavaScript? I'm confused. I'm going to try not to. Okay. <laughs> For at least till February sometime. Does it last that long? Uh. <laughs> well, that's about the time that all the gyms empty out, right? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I was basing that on. <laughs> all right. So, uh, you know, as we said before, be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, and more using your favorite podcast app. And be sure to leave us a review. Uh, we greatly appreciate that. And uh, it, it does go a long way to help others find us. And as I've said before, you know, mention us to a couple of friends, share the word, uh, you know, and, and let them know. And for people that you don't like, you know, tell more people that you don't like. <laughs> and it's easy to remember, www.codingblocks.net. And so contact us with a question, a topic, uh, leave your name. And if you want to be mentioned on the show, please leave us uh, your preferred method of shout out, whether it be Twitter 
uh, Facebook, whatever, and we'll mention you on the podcast. A review. Uh, blah. We're going to review them? No. <laughs> so if you mention us, we will review your comment. Yes, we will. <laughs> Is that what you were going with? We'll critique no, it. we will not. No. We will not do that. That would that would be wrong. So visit us at www.codingblocks.net where you can find show notes, examples, discussions, and more. And, and you can send your feedback, questions, and rants to comments at codingblocks. And we have a newsletter too that you can sign up for on the site. What? Uh, yeah, go check it out. We got some we ideas. Should, that should be a resolution. Yeah, that's the, one of the show's <laughs> oh, yeah. resolutions. Yeah, it is. That is the show resolution. We will start utilizing our our. What is it? Subscription list. Yep. There it you is. heard it. Alan made a promise. Yeah, Joe's going to fulfill so it. So that's a blog post <laughs> that Alan has coming. There's a newsletter that Alan has coming. Wasn't there one on Link? His, uh, oh, it was like Link versus uh, Never going to get it. 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 And uh, ah, happy new year. Yeah, yes. Make sure to t- follow us uh, on Twitter at coding blocks. Yep. Happy new year. Happy holidays. Everybody be safe and you know, best wishes for the new year, right? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs>